Welcome back to the Complete History of Coffee, episode 19, Why? Grab your favorite caffeinated beverage and let's get started. Okay, so today we are trying Maxwell House Coffee, which we will get into a little bit later in the episode. Um, it's an instant coffee, so probably not going to be my favorite. But one thing to point out is it says good to the last drop. And later on this episode, we'll find out if that's accurate or not. Start by smelling it. Uh, very light. A little bit of a roastiness to it. it. Says it's a medium roast, and I can kind of already pick that up just from the smell like it's not super roasty definitely an instant coffee it has almost that um sour taste you kind of get from a lot of instant coffees um as far as the overall flavor i feel like it's probably latin america i don't actually know where it's from it might be brazilian or something it doesn't taste like super high quality but it feels like it's a lot of different notes sort of mixed together to try to make it a little bit more, um, maybe not bland, but flat, not super roasty, not super acidic. It's just an overall pretty smooth cup of coffee. And we're going to go ahead and start today by going back to the mocha pot from last episode and kind of adding on a little bit more to it. We believe that this great creator has created nothing in vain, that everything that he has caused to grow on this old earth of ours, he has provided for some good and useful purpose. There is not a single nation under the sun but what has in their blood a desire for a stimulant of some character. It must and will be satisfied. We believe this article that we prepare for the people is God-given. This quote is from Joel Cheek. Someone we will talk about later this episode. I mention it at the start of this episode to showcase an instance in which coffee is being put on a platform, which makes it sound like a gift from God, contrasting the often negative views we have seen of coffee thus far, namely as a drink of Satan. Last episode, I mentioned how the mocha pot, a type of percolator, was invented in 1933 by the Italian Luigi de Ponti. But I found out this is a bit of an oversimplification. As it turns out, the mocha pot was actually created by Alfonso Bialetti. See, Alfonso was an engineer, and the idea for the coffee maker came after watching his wife doing laundry. She was using a lessive to wash the clothes. A machine which looked like a metal bucket with a hollow tube which had a perforated top. And if that's confusing you, the important part is, essentially, there was a flame on the bottom which heated the water, causing it to move up to a central tube and would then spill out over the clothing. If you don't know what a mocha pot or coffee percolator looks like, or how it works, it's exactly the same principle. The water is held on the bottom. You put it on the stove to boil the water, and once hot enough, it will move up into the middle chamber which holds the coffee, finally boiling to the top through a central tube into the top section which will hold your brewed coffee. Now, the design he came up with is what makes it special. Even if you didn't know what a mocha pot was before this podcast, most of you likely would recognize the coffee pot design when you see it, due to its unique octagonal shape. I say this because Alfonso Bialetti was not trying to create the next big invention to revolutionize coffee or to make loads of money, but instead he simply wanted to create a piece of art, which he never really planned to sell. Now, as to Luigi Di Ponte, he was actually the CEO of Alfonso's company, hence why he filed the patent for the product. But the real success behind the mocha pot was Alfonso's son, Renato Bialetti. Renato joined the family business just after World War II in 1946, and took the mocha pot from a niche product to one at the forefront of consumers. He utilized a new method of advertising, something called television, and helped the coffee maker to become a household item around the world. 
Coffee in the early 20th century underwent several changes. The first was a shift from local bulk batches to prepackaged brands. Many general stores struggled with this, often preferring bulk coffee in a barrel. Customers, however, certainly preferred the taste of fresher coffee, which was free of potential taste added from other products which had previously been in those barrels. Second, these growing coffee brands faced competition from door-to-door -door salesmen, chain stores, and mail-order catalogs. One such coffee brand we already mentioned in our last episode was the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. Originally the Great American Tea Company, founded in 1859, it expanded and changed its name just 10 years later to indicate its desire for growth on the international market. At the start of the 1900s, two brothers, George and John Hartford, began running the company. One brother, Mr. George as he was known, was focused on quality, being known for doing coffee cuppings every day at 3 p.m., even into his 90s. The other brother, Mr. John, wanted to expand the company's potential. For half a century, the company had operated by selling their product through deliveries and other stores. John decided to open up physical stores for the company to sell their products, cutting the price of their food down to wholesale cost. He standardized the architecture and layout of the stores to make them recognizable and easy to find everything, like a sort of Walmart. These stores were so successful, they opened three new locations on average every day from 1914 to 1916. Facing lashback from companies like Cream of Wheat, who wanted their product sold above retail price, John used the company he owned, the American Coffee Corporation, to buy coffee directly from Brazil, Colombia, and other countries to be roasted and ground himself. The Jewel Tea Company, by contrast, was peddling coffee as door-to-door -door salesmen, known as wagon men. They sold bulk coffee in major cities, giving away free household items and simply asking customers to buy their coffee, tea, and spices. This operated similar to Arbuckle's coupons for free items after enough purchases, but in this case, Jewel gave them the item up front with an agreement to buy a certain amount of coffee. Like good salesmen, they would of course show off another enticing item as soon as the customer was close to buying enough coffee for the last item. This inevitably upset grocers by stealing their business and coffee roasters because they roasted their own coffee. Attempting to compete in this ever-growing coffee market, brands began utilizing new marketing tactics. They saw milk using a sex appeal to gain customers, but were unwilling to use such an approach themselves. Well, with the exception of one brand, Satisfaction Coffee, who displayed a woman running from a man with the tagline, worth running after any time. That ad had mixed reviews, to say the least. During this time, there was a rising new field, psychology, which coffee men began to see as a method to manipulate customers. Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung paved the way for psychology, and it was the psychologist Dr. Hugo Munsterberg who introduced many to using psychology for business. Another brand rose at this time, Hills Brothers. Like Folger, Austin Hills was from New England, from a seafaring background, going to California during the gold rush in 1863. Not hitting the jackpot from gold, he began working for a shipbuilding company in San Francisco. Ten years later, he moved his two sons from Maine to California to join him. The brothers, Austin and Reuben Hills, started a small grocery stall together shortly thereafter. By 1881, the brothers purchased a retail coffee store, Arabian Coffee and Spice Mills. They roasted fresh coffee every day in front of their store to attract customers. Reuben took control of the coffee portion of the business, eventually adopting coffee cuppings as a way of ensuring its quality. 
They introduced the image of a bearded Arab man wearing a turban and robe to sponsor their Arabian roast coffee. This image remained on their coffee well into the 20th century, even though they switched to purchasing most of their coffee from Latin America at the start of the century. Their big innovation to coffee would come in 1899, shortly after the conclusion of the Spanish-American War. See, Hills Brothers was still in the market of selling dairy products like butter, and had received the contract to supply the U.S. Army during the war. They needed a better way to preserve their butter, and so met with Norton Brothers in Chicago to ask if they had any methods of achieving this goal. As it turns out, the Norton Brothers had just recently perfected a method of vacuum packing. Seeing an opportunity, Reuben attempted the process on freshly roasted coffee with great success. They then secured an exclusive deal to use this new vacuum packing on their coffee, forever changing the way coffee would be packaged and sold. Well, actually, it would take a while for vacuum-sealed coffee to be adopted by the whole country more broadly, but their coffee was recognized by many as being of better quality. Though they marketed their coffee would stay fresh forever if sealed, which is certainly an over-exaggeration, even with our modern-day's method of vacuum-sealing coffee. Their marketing was rather successful, as they kept track of their competitors' successes and failures in advertisement. Reuben picked red for their high-end Red Can brand, believing it was an eye-catching color. But they also launched cheaper, non-vacuum-sealed coffees to reach a larger customer base. They launched coffees mixed with cereal and chicory, had a glazed coffee known as Royal Roast to compete with Ariosa, and even had their coffee packed into children's school lunches in California. Another coffee company also came out of California's gold rush, MJB. In 1850, Joseph Brandenstein fled Germany to avoid conscription during the First Schleswig War, or the Three Years' War as it was known in Denmark. He went to California in hopes of striking gold, but was instead robbed, and eventually ended up in San Francisco selling tobacco and cigars. By 1899, his three oldest children joined him in forming a tea, coffee, and spice firm. Originally, M.J. Brandenstein and Company, named after Joseph and his oldest son, Max. They changed the name to M.J.B. to reduce sibling rivalry and to distance themselves from their Jewish-German heritage. Like Hill's brothers, one of the Brandenstein brothers would become a leader in the company's direction and the coffee industry. This brother was Manny, and he was known as a super salesman. Manny adopted vacuum packing in 1913 and went on to create his first brand, Climax Coffee. On the can was a sexy woman who appeared very satisfied drinking her coffee with the bold words Climax below her. This tactic wasn't quite as successful as he had hoped, but in turn he began putting the question why on all of his coffee. Why would he put why, you might be asking? Well, as he explained, what's the difference? As long as people are asking, as that makes sales. <laughs> he also took up a recent innovation in displays for his shop, putting light-up signs in the windows as eye-catching advertisements. Brandon Stein utilized reverse psychology to sell his top-tier coffee beans. He would put the cheapest beans on a fancy tray on his desk, and then the most expensive beans were placed on a simple-looking tray in the corner of his office. Manny refused to include racial slurs in his advertisements. Even though it was a popular way of creating humor to make sales, he told his daughter it was important to sell their product to as many people as possible, adding their family was a minority themselves, and, quote, jokes like these are a mean disguise for prejudice, end quote. Following Jim Folger's death in 1889, his son, James Folger II, took over the company at 26 years old, the same age as me. His first goal was to compete with other coffee companies on the West Coast, such as by putting a wooden spoon in every bag of coffee. 
Unfortunately, many grocery stores didn't notice the spoons and so ground them up with the rest of the coffee. So he switched over to metal spoons, but this led to several lawsuits as the metal spoons broke coffee grinders at various stores. Around 1900, Folger began working with a salesman, Otha Franks, to grow the company's coffee eastward. They started in Texas, but had to compete with Arbuckle and deal with the higher freight cost going eastward. Otha decided the best solution to this was to sell their highest grade coffee, promoting coffee quality over special coupons as Arbuckle was known for. Around this time, Folger began construction of a five-story factory in San Francisco. Completed in 1905, the building was set on pilings which were driven into the bay's muddy sea floor. And for those of you who are wondering why we care about the history of some random factory, I'm with you. Who cares? Well, that is until you realize the following year is when the great San Francisco earthquake was. On April 18th, 1906. The earthquake and subsequent fire led to the destruction of 80% of the city. But after the building survived the earthquake, it was then used as a headquarters by the U.S. Marines to pump water from the bay into the city to put out the fire. Folgers was then able to continue coffee manufacturing without delay, while Hills Brothers and MJB both had to rebuild their factories after burning down. Both companies began rebuilding immediately after, and MJB was paid in advance of $15,000 for an order of coffee during this time by a Japanese company, Kamikawa Brothers, who wanted to help them get back on their feet, including a telegram which stated, quote, Japanese understand earthquakes, end quote. Moving eastward, we get back to our friends Caleb Chase and James Sanborn of the company Chase and Sanborn. They both retired in 1899, leaving their junior partner Charles Sayas to run the company. While Chase continued visiting the Boston office every day until his health began to decline before his death, Sayas was now fully in charge. He created a booklet called After Dinner Tricks and Puzzles with Your Seal Brand Coffee, a collection of brain teasers to help promote sales. Unlike Brandon Stein, he had no problem using racist advertisements on the company's products, as well as sexism of the day. He had ads with black people depicted as deformed and unintelligent, and ads which suggested a housewife's worth was based on pleasing her husband with good quality coffee. The same year as the San Francisco fire, the company expanded westward, coinciding with an influx of coffee-drinking Scandinavians in the region. They set up a new factory in Montreal, which ran on electricity, leading their business to triple. If you remember from last episode, Maxwell House Coffee was purchased by General Foods, the company created by the Antichrist of Coffee, Charlie Post. But before this, it was a coffee company started out of Nashville by Joel Cheek. Cheek started out working for a coffee company himself, selling coffee to grocers in Kentucky. Knowing little to nothing about the product he sold, but after suggesting store owners sell the expensive brand his company offered, he felt he owed it to them to actually try the coffee and realized the cheaper brand was more flavorful. He later became a partner in Cheek Webb & Company, meeting Roger Smith through the firm. Smith was an expert at determining flavors in coffee by smelling unroasted beans. Sounds like he was a bit of a coffee master. <laughs> uh, get it? Because I was a coffee master when I worked at Starbucks? No? Okay, moving on. So the two men worked together to create a blend of coffee from different places. Brazil was the cheapest and so formed the base, while Mexico and Colombia provided more flavors and acidity to the coffee. In 1892, Cheek offered Maxwell House a high-end hotel, a free trial of the coffee. After a week of using their coffee, guests at the hotel complained once the hotel had returned back to their previous blend. 
So the hotel agreed to start buying Cheeks coffee, and after six months, he was granted use of the name Maxwell House for his coffee blend. The following year, Cheek opened a wholesale business to sell his coffee, and by 1901, he opened the Nashville Coffee and Manufacturing Company, specializing in their Maxwell House coffee. The name was eventually changed to Cheek Neal Coffee Company for the two owners, Joel Cheek and John Neal. Between 1905 and 1960, they expanded across the southern U.S., opening up roasting facilities in Texas, Florida, and Virginia. It was during this time Cheek's sons began joining the business. His oldest son became very skilled at advertising. He emphasized the coffee's high quality, which did well in the South, which often had cheaper brands cut with lower-grade coffees from Brazil, or even cereal. To emphasize the coffee's eloquence, Cheek made a slogan for the coffee based on President Theodore Roosevelt's raving review of it. He apparently tried it after a hunting trip to Mississippi, saying it was, quote, good to the last drop, end quote. Now, Teddy Roosevelt is my favorite American president. I mean, come on, the guy had the teddy bear named after him. So, I trust his opinion. However, this supposed quote is from 1908, but was not published on Maxwell House Coffee until the 1920s. Which seems to be even more interesting when you find out Coca-Cola said its drink was good to the last drop in 1908. Seems a little suspicious to me, but oh well, I'm sure a corporation would never lie to us just to make more money. Besides Maxwell House Coffee, Cheek Neal Coffee Company had over 50 brands of coffee, including a chicory blend. In fact, they were found to be putting chicory in some of their coffees without noting it on label, which led them to be fined under the Pure Food and Drug Act we talked about last episode. There was in fact a small label which read coffee and chicory, but it was tiny compared to the main label which stated Cheek and Neal Cup Quality Coffee. However, the lawsuit did little to hold back Cheek, who was elected vice president of the National Coffee Roasters Association in 1914. He was a strong voice in the association, speaking of how, quote, various grades of coffee you roast can be made to yield certain results in the cup that will cheapen the cost, end quote. Adding, quote, if you don't know that, you ought to get busy and learn it, end quote. Keep in mind the art and science of roasting and blending was not as commonly understood at this time. Further, he encouraged treating your employees as members of your family and felt attempting to take money from customers for a worthless product was immoral. Back in our episode of Coffee Cold War, we talked about John Arbuckle and his war with the Sugar King to create a coffee empire with his glazed coffee. Returning to the story of Arbuckle Brothers, We find that by 1910, the company was the biggest coffee company in the country, but they were beginning to face fierce competition from other companies, slowly being considered of lesser quality by some consumers. Two years later, in 1912, Arbuckle passed away, leaving the company to his nephew, Will Jamison. As we talked about previously, Arbuckle's coffee brand was Ariosa. So Jamison sought to remedy the brand's degrading image. He started by coming out with a pre-ground coffee, as this had overtaken whole bean coffee by this point, and then he set out to create a new high-end coffee. He hired the J. Walter Agency to help them launch and advertise a new brand. Preliminarily referred to as Aro Coffee, It was in fact John Arbuckle's personal blend, having only been gifted to people within his social circle. The agency outlined how the product needed to be high quality, uniform, have an easy to remember name, wide distribution, and needed to become an unconscious habit for the consumer to continue purchasing it. They had quality and uniformity ready to go, and the name was in the works, meaning they just needed to grow distribution and create a national habit. For the name, they went with Eubin, although Arbuckle executives suggested having the name Arbuckle in the title, 
The JWT agency warned them against it, as the name had a low-class image. To gain consumers, they published ads directed at women, the primary buyers of coffee at this time. They also utilized sealed containers to create an image of freshness to the coffee. A massive ad campaign was undertaken in 1913, which stated Eubin was, quote, the private coffee of the greatest coffee merchants, end quote, which was previously only for their personal use as gifts at Christmas time. They promised grocers would be prepared to supply them with the new coffee by December 1st. Within 10 weeks, their campaign led them to be the top-selling packaged coffee in New York, leading them to launch their campaign in Chicago. As one reporter noted, Eubin created a, quote, atmosphere of refinement and class, end quote. On a side note, the success of JWT's ads, those for Arbuckle, and just in general, were largely due to Helen Lansdowne, who helped to ensure successful advertisement directed at women. She was a part of a new class of women who aided in the rise of feminism. While it was men taking credit for her ads, she helped grow several brands through the use of pro and even sexist advertisement. They had to support the idea that women needed to buy good coffee for their husbands while also encouraging women's rights. But while women in coffee advertising were gaining ground for equality, the women in the coffee industry itself were often paid less than their male counterparts. Two women broke into the roasting industry, however, as Sarah Rohrer created her own Sarah Tyson Rohrer's Blend in 1911, and Alice Foote McDougall, who created a coffee empire during the first part of the 20th century. Rohrer's Coffee Company had mild success, but did not gain enough traction and eventually shut down. However, McDougall achieved much better success in wealth. Her husband, a successful coffee importer in New York, passed away in 1907, leaving her with three children and only $38 in the bank. She decided to take her own knowledge of coffee and go into business out of an office on New York's Front Street. She faced hostility from men in the industry, and many refused to sell her coffee. Eventually, she did secure a supply of coffee to roast and was able to begin selling her coffee, initially to her family and friends. But as her business grew, so did her customer base. Within two years, she was making a gross profit of $20,000 a year, but her net profit was only four cents for every pound of coffee sold. She persevered, stating, quote, It is this kind of determination that man has acquired through long generations. And the woman who is to conquer in the business world must acquire too if she is to succeed. End quote. But for all this, she considered herself an anti-feminist, even though the book she wrote was titled To Women Whom I Love and Would Help, a book which stated, quote, It is futile to ask women not to go into business. One cannot stop world movements, end quote. Yet she also felt women should not be allowed to vote. She simply rode on the wave of feminism as a means to make money to support herself and her family. In any case, by 1920, just after World War I, women had gained new rights, including the right to vote. Next time will be episode 20, our big recap of everything in the show thus far. So, if any of you have any questions or comments about the show, feel free to mention them on social media at the Complete History Podcast Series, or by emailing us at completehistorypod at gmail.com. As always, this show is written and produced by me, Eric Zachary. If you have not already, please consider supporting this podcast series on Patreon. For the price of a coffee a month, you can support this and future projects in this series, while also getting access to members' episodes, transcripts of the show, and a chance to win merch. This month, I will be giving away the book Coffee Dictionary to one of our Patreon members. Make sure to join our community on social media at The Complete History Podcast Series. Don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on, and make sure to share it with your family and friends. To close, here's a quote from Abigail Reynolds. I like my coffee with cream and my literature with optimism. <laughs>